This is Winston Churchill, speaking to you from number 10, Downing Street. Nothing lifts my spirits like a blast of Professor Buzzkill during our darkest hour. He busts myths and takes names like a squadron of spitfires strafing enemy positions. And I'm totally stoked that he's here again to save Western civilization. So... Relax with your favorite whiskey and become enlightened. Yes, indeed, it's Professor Buskill here for your listening pleasure. You know, July the 4th is upon us, as it happens upon us every year, and two things are likely to happen, at least for American buzzkillers. The first is that we'll use the July 4th national holiday as an opportunity to take a midsummer vacation or extend a weekend vacation, that sort of thing. The second thing is that we will be treated to a great number of canned, of poorly researched, and even more poorly argued soundbite history, and I'm putting history in quotation marks, stories about the Declaration of Independence from a lot of traditional media outlets. And of course, the same thing will happen only more intensified over email, social media, and other podcasts. I don't mean to cast shade, as the young people say on other podcasts, but it happens to be true about this thing. I don't think this show, this episode anyway, will be just exclusively of to, to the interest of the interest of Americans because I think other buzz killers out there, of, uh, out there, and there are a lot of you in other countries, We'll see that a lot of your own national or cultural or regional stories have a similar sort of pattern that starts from something very small and then is built into a larger and larger myth that's treated as absolute fact. It happens almost everywhere. Now, back to the 4th of July. No doubt a few of the stories we'll hear will be good and solidly based, but historical urban legends... Again, have only been enhanced by social media, and their spread and influence has been greatly boosted by mass emailings and Facebook posts, as I say, put up carelessly and perhaps reposted and forwarded in a knee jerk way without any thought as to whether the content of those posts have any evidence behind them. For instance, we'll hear that John Hancock, you know, he of the big signature, Quip to the assembled delegates that after he signed the Declaration of Independence so hugely, there, King George will be able to read that without his spectacles. And we'll be told by an email myth that will not die that essentially the British Army went around during the Revolutionary War rounding up signers of the Declaration of Independence and marked them for special punishment and torture. Let's look at some of the history of the Declaration of Independence, the complications in that history, and whether any of the things your crazy uncle sends in those emails or your nutty aunt posts on Facebook or your less than literate colleague at work seems to enjoy spreading, whether any of those things are true. And we'll give you the ammunition to fight your own revolutionary battle against historical myths, against myth makers, and against myth spreading. So first of all, why did the American colonies and the colonists need a declaration of independence? After all, the colonies, more or less united, had been at war with Great Britain since April 1775 and had certainly witnessed deteriorating relations with the mother country since 1765. Again, tensions increased in the mid-1770s and the colonists met in the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia in October 1774 to discuss how they together should respond to the pressure from the, from the British government to agree with new colonial taxes and trade regulations. At that First Continental Congress, they agreed to boycott British goods, first of all, demand repeal of the Coercive Acts right, passed by Parliament to punish Massachusetts for the Boston Tea Party in 1773. But 
neither of these things lessened the British Parliament's desire to clamp down on colonial discontent. And so a second Continental Congress was called in 1775 to manage the war against the crown and discuss whether the colonies should declare full independence from Great Britain. This second Continental Congress debated these matters on and off for a year before deciding to press on with an independence resolution. Now, two significant things prompted the actual Declaration of Independence. The first was the delegates' realization that they needed to declare themselves as an independent nation in order to get foreign help for the Revolutionary War. The other great European powers might help a revolt by Britain's American colonies. But these countries had their own colonies, and messing around with the British colonial system might invite British retaliation against their own, you know, the French, for instance, colonial system. In other words, a colonial war wasn't something to be entered into lightly. Okay, Some members of the Second Continental Congress and some members of the First Continental Congress believe that a strong declaration right, would help those, some of those foreign powers overcome their uneasiness about getting into a colonial war. The second thing was the influence that Englishman Thomas Paine and his publications had on supporters of the American complaints against the British crown and empire. Now, although many of the founding fathers thought Payne wasn't as sophisticated and careful a thinker as they were, Thomas Jefferson, for instance. His work, that is Payne's work, was becoming popular in the chattering classes in the colonies. Many in the Continental Congresses thought that they should jump on the Payne bandwagon. So they urged other members of the Continental Congress to consider the Payne-esque, if you will, public relations value of a major and strong statement through a declaration of independence. Now, it took a few months for the delegates to the Second Continental Congress to overcome disagreements between themselves in early 1776. But by the end of June, they had agreed not only to declare independence, but to publish the declaration and the reasons why. They voted that way on July 2nd, and some Delegates, including John Adams, thought that July 2nd would become known as Independence Day because that's when the question of independence was decided. But it took a couple of more days for some of the textual details to be hammered out. And it was resolved on July 4th to finish the document and send it to be printed. And I'm being sort of hair-splitting and technical here because it's important. You'll see that this in a minute. And even then, that It wasn't the final version that we all know and love. In the first place, the actual July 4th document was typeset and printed, not published through the, quote, engrossing process of creating a facsimile of a handwritten document. More on that in a moment. And that's obviously the one we know and love again, like I say now. The first July 4th, declaration was printed in Philadelphia and distributed widely. The title read, In Congress, July 4, 1776, a declaration by the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled. So far, so good, right? That's what we ended up with, right? Well, no. The Declaration of Independence was, for want of a better term, a living document for the next few months, kind of like the Constitution is a living document because it's been amended a lot. It's a living document, sort of permanently, the Constitution, that is. When it came to producing the engrossed, i.e. handwritten, copy for printing, the delegates decided to change the wording. They voted on July 19th to, and I'm sort of using the, the procedural language of the Second Continental Congress, when I read this quote out, resolved that the declaration passed on the 4th, 
be fairly engrossed on parchment with the title and style of, quote, the Unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America, end quote. That's a quote, quote within this longer quote that I'm giving you. And that the same, again, this is the, their wording of the res, revolu, re, revolution, resolution continuing, and that the same, when engrossed, be signed by every member of Congress. That changed the title from, quote, a declaration by the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled to, quote, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, end quote. They added unanimous to give more solidarity to the sentiments expressed. It finalized the text we know today. They also resolved that all the members of Congress, that is, those who had voted on it during the Second Continental Congress, not nearly as large as the Congress, the Congresses in the future, the, certainly the Congress we have today, all the members of those Congress would sign the engrossed version and that their signatures would be printed on the copies produced. Now, that was probably done in early August. There's sort of evolving and emerging complications and complex and, and, and contours in the dating of when actually people went in and wrote their and, and put their John Hancock on the on the Declaration of Independence. But it's safe to say that four dates could have been chosen as America's Independence Day. July 2nd, when independence was agreed by vote. July 4th, when the first declaration was printed. July 19th, that date when the introductory text got amended to make it more, quote, unanimous, unquote. And again, I emphasize unanimous when I read it a moment ago. Or August 2nd, when most of the delegates actually signed the declaration and in effect pledged, quote, to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, end quote. And that's the phrase that ends the document and appears just above the signatures. Perhaps the most fun myths and misunderstandings about the Declaration of Independence, however, are related to a couple of reported quips supposedly uttered by John Hancock and by Benjamin Franklin. First, let's take John Hancock, who was the president of the Second Continental Congress and whose signature is large and central on the document that we all know. In fact, John Hancock has become a synonym for signature, right, in American culture almost ever since, as in, put your John Hancock right here when you're signing away your future buying a house or investing in Professor Buzzkill, right? According to one of the myths about Hancock and his signature, he was the first to sign the document, and he said aloud, after he signed, there, I guess King George will be able to read that. And of course, there are variations of the story, and the only thing that changes is what Hancock was supposed to have said after signing his name so hugely and prominently. First example, King George can read that without his spectacles. Second example, there. John Bull can read my name without spectacles and may now double his reward of 500 pounds for my head. That is my defiance. Third, the British ministry can read that name without spectacles. Let them double their reward. Well, you know what I'm going to say. There's absolutely no good evidence that Hancock said anything after signing the Declaration. The reason that his signature is so central and so prominent is that he was the president of the Second Continental Congress that wrote and improved the Declaration. Similarly, after signing the Declaration, good old Ben Franklin was supposed to have quipped, There you have it, gentlemen. We must all hang together. Or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. Just like the 
Hancock quote, this is considered to be an absolute fact. In fact, both of those quotes I heard as in, in lectures given to me by history professors when I was an undergraduate, right? But of course, again, there's no evidence that it happened. And the earliest time that quote appears, the Ben Franklin quote, as in addition to the John Hancock quote, a quote, really is the mid-19th century in stories about the founding fathers, 50, 60, 70 years later, similar to the George Washington and Cherry Tree Smith. Cherry Tree's chopping down, you know, I have done it pa here with my own little hatchet, I cannot tell. All that stuff doesn't show up until much, much later. Now, we're going to get to this famous what hap- uh, the, the price they paid myth much, much after this station ID break we're going to take right now. So back in a minute. This is General George Washington. I never go into battle or start a new country without consulting Professor Buzzkill. Professor Buzzkill is part of Entertainment One's podcast network and is available on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and all major podcast apps. Please subscribe and leave him a review. Please also go to ProfessorBuzzKill.com to support him on Patreon, to subscribe to his email notifications, and to shop the Buzzkill bookshelf. Follow him on Facebook, on Twitter at BuzzKillProf, and on Instagram at ProfessorBuzzKill. Thanks for listening. So we're back, we're back, we're back. Now, the biggest myth I want to go after here, and the one that seems to be the most persistent, is the famous price they paid myth that flies around in email circles every 4th of July. Okay, now, the, why, why does this bother me so much rather than the other two? The other two about John Hancock's signature, the other, two, the other one about the date. Well, the thing about the date is, you know, sort of, a variable, right? It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. We have a fixed July Fourth as a great iconic day, but we could just as easily have a fixed July second or one of those dates in August that I mentioned, and it wouldn't have made any difference in terms of the way American history is understood or appreciated. And the signature quips are just quips. There, there are no quotes, as we famously say in our other quote or no quote shows. That yeah, okay. They sort of add a little color to the story, and they're you know ultimately, ultimately ultimately in that way kind of harmless. The price they paid myth is not harmless, okay. And again, I know I keep saying this, but I want to remind you that when the nutty uncle sends an email out, or that crazy guy in the office next door who's always sending things out without bother, bothering to even check a grade school encyclopedia. This is what we're talking about. Okay? The price they paid myth. And I debated about how best to present this myth to you, whether read out the entire email and then show you where it's wrong or analyze it claim by claim. And I decided here on the latter because I was afraid that reading out the whole text, which would, first of all, make me blow my stack on the air, so to speak, especially if I did it without interruption, I might be mistaken for reading out an accurate history of what happened to the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, right? People might be able to say if they listen to just a soundbite of this show that, oh, well, I heard on Professor Buskill that this price they paid story, you know, is absolutely true. Anyway, so I won't read the, 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 the full text of it for that reason. Let's take the price they paid email apart piece by piece. There are some general fallacies and falsehoods that run throughout the whole thing that should really caution any buzz killer when reading a document such as this. In the first place, there's the common general fallacy uh, about history in, used in, in discussing historical events, and it operates this way. Because person A committed Act X in 1776, and then 10 years later, was captured by the enemy doesn't necessarily 
mean that they were targeted for capture because they committed Act X, or that they had their property damaged or destroyed mainly because they committed Act X. There might be other acts they have committed that led to their their torture or capture or destruction of their property. Act Y or, or Act Z, whatever. The price they paid starts this way. Five signers, it says, were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Again, yes, four signers of the Declaration of, of Independence were captured by the British during the Revolutionary War. George Walton, Thomas Haywood Jr., Arthur Middleton, and Edward Rutledge. But there's no evidence that they were captured or targeted specifically because they signed the Declaration of Independence. They were captured as kind of, I, don't, I hate to say it this way, but it's really normal prisoners of war while fighting against the British. They were not tortured while they were prisoners, and they did not die when they were, uh, while, while they were POWs. In other words, the British Army didn't go around. There's no, it's, again, be careful with my own language here. There's no, there's no evidence that the British Army went around with the copies of, you know, extra copies of the Declaration of, of Independence looking down at the 56 names and say, well, let's find these bastards and get them first, right? No. They, you know, a fifth grader could understand that, it, you know, the British Army is trying to win the war and they'll capture as many uh, um, co colonial soldiers as as they need to. It, it, if one of those colonial soldiers had signed the Declaration of Independence, they're being captured or killed or whatever because they're a colonial soldier. They wouldn't even know, probably, especially given the what, the nature of 18th century battle. You know, oh look, there's Ben Franklin. You know, a, a thousand yards away. Let's shoot him because he's the one. Who, who signed the Declaration of Independence rather than the next soldier in line. Of course, Ben Franklin was too old for that, but you see what I'm saying. Okay? Now, after ranting about all that, I have to say that Richard Stockton of New Jersey was captured by the British because he signed the Declaration of Independence. At least we have evidence for one of the 56 signers. But it's more interesting than the email would let you would, would have you believe the price they paid email that is. Technically, on November 30th, 1776, he was taken prisoner by local British sympathizers, that is, local Tories, American Tories, if you will, right? American loyalists, and turned over to the British Army, which is garrisoned in New York. Okay, so it's not as if the British army under, you know, the Duke of Wellington shows up. By the way, the Duke of Wellington wasn't in the Inter uh, War of Independence. But if it's not like he shows up rummaging through New Jersey, say, where is that traitor Richard Stockton? But it is the case that born and bred American colonists in New Jersey captured him and turned him over to the British army. Anyway, Stockton was thrown in jail, kept in deplorable conditions until released in mid-1777. His health utterly ruined. Didn't die as a, as a prisoner of war, but it certainly didn't make, it, uh, make his life any easier health-wise after that. Now, the price they paid email goes on. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Yes, several signers of the Declaration had their property destroyed during the Revolutionary War. But again, it wasn't because they were targeted as, targeted as signers of the Declaration of Independence, but because that property was either in the path of battle or because it was captured, occupied, and destroyed by one of the marauding armies, British or colonial. What's that, Professor, you say? One of the armies? Yeah. The big houses owned by prominent lawyers and politicians were captured and commandeered by both the British and the American forces. Well, maybe I should e say either the British or the American forces 
as the battles of the Revolutionary War raged, depending on who needed the most, who was closest geographically, right? And who was in the strongest position to capture the property. Property was one of those things, and particularly big houses, one of those things that armies desperately needed. You know, they didn't exactly have an entire entire mass units following them around to to provide hospitals and other things for, for their soldiers, right? So it's quite possible that a perfectly loyal American colonist, and sorry, I shouldn't say loyal because let's be confused with loyalist to the British crown. It's perfectly possible, indeed likely, especially in the Northeast, that a per, that a perfectly fierce American colonist, fierce for independence, had his property confiscated by the by not let's just say George Washington and his troops, okay, because they needed it, not because. They were after him for his political opinions, right? Another big quote in the, uh, or the big line in the email, the price they paid. Two signers lost their sons serving in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured, right? end quote. Again, partly true. Abraham Clark from New Jersey had two sons captured and imprisoned on a ship. John Witherspoon also from New Jersey, had his eldest son killed at the Battle of Germantown. The other son killed during the war has has not yet been identified, even all this time later. But again, there's no evidence that any of these sons of of Declaration Signers were targeted because their fathers had signed the, the Declaration of Independence. From all the available evidence, and this is going to sound cold and heartless, but it's one of these historical things we have to pay attention to. These uh, war deaths or these war prisoners captured or these war casualties were part of the normal, if you will, flow of revolutionary war backwards and forwards. Here's another quote. Nine of the 56 signers fought and died from wounds or hardships of the revolutionary war. End quote. Technically, this is true, but buzzkillers across the nation and the world recognize a misleading statement when they hear it. Yes, nine signers of the Declaration of Independence died during the Revolutionary War, but they did not die from war wounds or the deprivations caused by the war. At least none of them died as a, as a result of injuries inflicted directly or indirectly by the British Army or even Navy the only founding father who died from wounds received during the Revolutionary War was Button Gwinnett from Georgia. But even his wounds were from a fellow Continental officer who shot Gwinnett during a duel in May 1777. Yeah, they had a duel between themselves while the war against the British was going on. The other who died, the other eight who died from died during the war, the other eight signers, those were mostly the the various causes, mostly natural, medical, accidental, okay? They caught diseases, they caught old age or or whatever, you know? It wasn't exactly a time, as I said, when you had serving in the army was a particularly healthy occupation. And there's more. The price they paid also says that the signers had their property and livelihoods ruined by the British. Again, these claims are either untrue or greatly exaggerated. Carter Braxton of Virginia did indeed have his fleet of merchant ships captured by the British Navy, but there's no evidence that he was targeted because he signed the Declaration of Independence, and he certainly didn't die penniless, as the story claims. Same is true of Thomas McKean, whose treatment during the Revolutionary War not only can't be contributed to the, attributed to the fact that he signed the Declaration of Independence, but can be attributed to the fact that he was the voluntary leader of colonial militia forces. And the same is true of the eight signers who are listed as having their property looted. Again, there's no evidence that the looters or marauding armies were, were running around targeting the signers of the Declaration of Independence with extra copies of the document in their pockets to check as a checklist. 
you know, while they were moving through the regions they captured. And finally, I know you're tired of all this nitpicking, what sounds like nitpicking. There are these sort of personal stories that the price they paid, you know, throws out there. For instance, that Francis Lewis's wife was captured by the British and held because he was a signatory to the Declaration. She was captured along with other civilians on Long Island and held by the British looking for a deal whereby British w- wives of British officers could be exchanged for colonial civilians. That's what happened. Okay? They weren't marauding through Long Island, Long Island saying, we have to get the wife of that French, Francis Lewis. Right? That'll turn the war. Again, the price they paid even claims that John Hart of New Jersey was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His field and his gristmill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart, end quote. Okay. Now, again, I know it sounds like I'm making fun of these poor people who fought, were involved in the Revolutionary War. But I don't mean to by my tone, right? I mean to, I mean that tone to be part of my debunking of these myths by saying that, first of all, in this case you'll see it's not true, but also it's this, you know, just because certain things happen at a certain time doesn't mean that A and then, hap- and, you know, event A happened and then event B happened later doesn't mean event A caused event B. Okay. By the time the British captured John Hart of New Jersey's part of the state, right? He had significant land holdings. In late 1776, his wife had already been dead. She died several weeks earlier. And all his children, right, didn't flee for their lives. They were grown up and off on their own. He didn't run off and live in force in case. There's no evidence he did, anyway. And further, he lived well into 1779 and served in the the New Jersey Assembly in the intervening years. Please don't get me wrong. Certainly, signing the Declaration of Independence was a brave act. And each of the delegates to the Continental Congress knew the significance of what he was doing. But signing up to fight in the war was also a brave act. For all the 15, 16, 17, and 18, all the way to age 30, men uh, age thirty, men who did sign up, right? Okay. So how does this false story, how does the, the price they paid myth get circulated? Well, it turns out that this myth is kind of easy to pin down chronologically. I've had fleets of Buzzkill Institute historians working on this. And they've traced it back to Paul Harvey, the famous radio commentator who used to come up with, his famous tagline was, the rest of the story. He published it in a 1956 book with that very title, The Rest of the Story. But where he got it, or whether he came up with it on his own, is impossible to say. The thing is, Paul Harvey's popularity on the radio meant that when political talk radio really turned off and really took off, I should say, in the in the nineteen eighties, this story was picked up by Ann Landers, who's not a, not really a political talk radio host, but certainly Rush Limbaugh was, and then later by Pat Buchanan, who had his own show, and even Oliver North, that disgraced a general uh, who had who had his own show. In fact, I think it's even his own cable TV show. And it's undoubtedly from them that General Richard B. Myers, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the year 2000, sent out an Independence Day message that repeated these same stories, the 56, the the price they paid of the 56 signers, without checking whether it's true. So when when a general, when the general of the Joint Chiefs of Staff sends out 
an email like this. It's not the same, it's not the same as Rush Limbaugh repeat, put it, saying it on his show, although people seem to believe all that stuff. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a big time government official, right? Then it really does get the stamp right, of supposed historical truth. Okay. Well, again, I expect that many of you will hear the story. You'll read it in emails. You'll see it in Facebook posts. But probably not Twitter. Those those posts aren't long enough to allow something as as verbose as the price they paid myth. Right this year, you'll see it next year. I don't know. Maybe someday it'll fade off. But be forewarned. Buzzkill Institute historians and researchers have set you straight, and you're welcome. You can thank us, right, by emailing in and say to info at Professor Buzzkill saying. Thanks for that story. You really made me understand a little bit more about how these myths start and spread. You can go to Patreon and really thank us by becoming a member of Buzz, Buzzkill Asian for as little as a dollar, as has been said before in the station ID. And you can please send me email about anything you'd like to. You can please comment on things I put on Twitter over and over and over again. I keep saying, please shout back at me. Tell me stuff you think I might have gotten wrong. We can have a dialogue, right? We get plenty, of, well, we get some comments from listeners, but we don't get enough. Hundreds wouldn't be enough. I love talking about this stuff. I love hearing it, about it from you, and I want to be able to talk to you more on an individual basis. You tweet something to me, I'm going to respond to you directly. So do it ASAP, and I'll talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>